Welcome to the pro-black perspective where black problems are addressed with black solutions. Your host tonight is the author of the pro-black compendium and Zuberi and the Maroons of Ma'a, the Pan-African nationalist Oni. Oni, what are we discussing tonight? Peace, 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 family. Um, looks like I uh, have an option to fix this uh, chat. What we're going to do is we're going to... Um, we are going to discuss Nkrumah. And we're going to discuss America. I think a lot of us do not realize that America is the enemy. America is the enemy. Um... And, 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 you know, obviously I'm saying that while I'm in America and that, you know, sometimes has consequences, <laughs> but it's, it's the truth. And, and this is the thing about the world, really. In this world, there's actually, actually, there's this, uh, I don't want to say an ancient African proverb. And matter of fact, I want to realize, I realize in retrospect that I might've been reading the wrong ancient book. I have, um, three um, and I might have been reading the wrong one, but all the same, in ancient Africa, um, you know, one of the lessons you could glean off the wall is this. Images are near reality, are closer to reality than mere definitions, right? So this emphasis on reality versus fantasy, if you will, um, and, and this emphasis on images, imagination, um, versus uh, reality is present in ancient African civilizations, okay? Um, or at least one, right? Uh, why do we say this, right? Because you have to clarify for people in the simplest terms, who is your opposition? Your opposition are nation states. Your goal is to is to live, exist, and, prop, and, and, and expand within a nation state. And everything short of that is short. So what we're going to do is we're going to go into this commercial. Um, we're going to talk about the network. Um, and then we're going to get back into the program about who killed Nkrumah and why. This is D Webb with the Harsh Reality Podcast, asking you to tune in where we tackle the news of the day that affects our community only on KWAZ Radio. Greetings, everyone. This is Koku from the Bitter Medicine Podcast, inviting you to tune in to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. Greetings, fam. Tune in to The Learning Curve with me, the revolutionary matron on KWAZ Radio. You are listening to the pro-black perspective on KWAZ Radio. All right, all right, all right. So, fam, we're actually going to check out a YouTube video. So if you guys know about Shoot the Breeze, make sure you guys check out Shoot the Breeze. It's pretty fun. Um, I mean, I, a lot of it, you know, there's a lot of trolls. <laughs> at least one, but you know, beyond that, uh, it was pretty damn fun. Um, and one of the one of the formats there is you know you play a video, and um, you might comment on it. I'm not gonna play the video and comment on it. I guess not. But I, was, I thought I was, but I guess I'm not going to. What are we gonna do is we're gonna see this 16 minute video and turn it into I don't know, <laughs> turn it into an hour maybe. I don't know. Uh, but why we're gonna do this? Well, one is this, right? It gives a lot of good information. Two. This is the type of stuff that we really need to bring into Africa. So, like I said, you go to Africa to explore and figure out what it is that you can do. What it is that, like, what's the environment? What's in demand? What do people, what do people need? What will people pay for? Now, I'm not going to say people are going to pay for translations of this video. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe they'll pay for food and you can offer food while you play these videos. Who knows? I can tell you guys this, that when I was uh, here in Brooklyn, uh, Brooklyn, America, if you will, Brooklyn, New York, New York, America, whatever, right? Um, here in Brooklyn, there was this store based, you know, based around um, Nation of Islam books, I guess, right? And outside of their window, they would play uh, loud um, Farrakhan speeches, 
Okay, so you're walking by, I believe it's Fulton Street, kind of near Atlantic Avenue kind of thing, right? Um, you're walking by that area, and, and it's not there anymore, obviously, but um, back in the day, you'd walk by there, and then you would hear Farrakhan saying some old dumb shit, because that's what Farrakhan does. Um, <laughs> but uh, that's, that's, that was a nice tool for showcasing a Farrakhan speech. Now, the, the trouble with Farrakhan or, or just most of black American um, speakers is that they're in English. And so if I were to blast even my podcast in a window, it would not, um, it would not register in the same way. And, and granted, I would say that as far as speaking is concerned, um, my podcasts do not, um, um, like they're a little bit more disjointed than um, a real lecture. Um, I'll, all the same, what I can say is that this video is well done. This video is well done. It's in English as well, but it's well done. Okay? What we can do, or what, what, what I think, um, and I didn't upload that video. I really should have uploaded this video that I took in Tan Tanzania where the, um, they're playing a movie. And the movie was entirely dubbed. Entirely dubbed, um, even to the point of the auditor or the dubber was describing what was on the scene. So, you know, and, and this was in Swahili. So they would say in Swahili, you know, the person opened the door and looked out, looked out the wind, like looked out the door and saw somebody else looking at them. And then they ducked under and pulled out their gun and tried to shoot like they would describe the entire scene. I don't see why they do that instead of just <laughs> dubbing over the voices, but they did that. Um, in essence, there is this huge market for dubbed material, and obviously these were movies, so um, obviously you know you could expect a uh, market for movies. Uh, but um, I still want to uh, explain that you know content like this uh, made into uh, Swahili or whatever language you choose for whatever African nation you choose to get to. Um, that's good content. And and we should really be on top of that. You know, part of me is thinking to myself, maybe just to spice up this podcast, I can show off that video. I don't know where I would... I don't know if I uploaded it on the internet, though. I mean, not on the internet. I don't know if I downloaded it onto my computer, though. So I'm just going to technically look through... Um, yeah, I'm going to technically look through, uh, make sure that it's nothing... Um, <laughs> nothing too uh inappropriate because <laughs> those exist too um yeah actually actually i'm thinking actually just for the sake of it just before we even get into the content because it's really imperative that we understand like one of the reasons why you want to expose yourself to the world is to expose yourself to more examples of of how things uh could be should be or how things are um, so I'm just going to look up the ID of this video really quickly and hopefully, hopefully I can find it because there's a lot of videos that, um, you know, there's a lot of videos that I don't want people to see. And plus, you know how it is. Oh, I think this is it right here. Is this it? Um, just give me two seconds. I just got to test out this thing. And obviously I'm also waiting for some people to show, to come through. Oh, we got Kofi. Kofi's here. Uh. Kofi says greetings. Um, let me actually see. Can I? Can I see? So it's not even appearing on the screen. Oh, I tell you guys, I, I updated this uh, software and it's 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 been corrupted. Like essentially, it it no longer shows people's contributions on the screen. And this was like through coding, but they decided to I guess rewrite the code or something. I don't know. Um, oh, and also, I, I updated my graphics card, and that screwed up everything. It, it, it's just weird how the world is... Uh, oh. On my way back, um, yeah, they tell me... Uh, one guy tells me it's 25,000. No, uh, then he's like, no, I can lower it to 18,000. So finally... No, that was just my video of some, some idiot exploiting me. Um, all right, whatever. Let's just get to the yeah, right, uh, Nkrumah then. 
Um, just because we got we got some people waiting, let's just get to it. Uh, so the video, so this video is is going. We're gonna just get through it. We're just gonna interrupt it sometimes. Oh, you you gonna notice my graphic card is stupid freaking slow. You see? Oh, gosh. Like I downloaded a new driver for my graphics card, and it's now like I don't want to play audio anymore. Um, it's the weirdest thing, but. It is what it is. The Central Intelligence Agency, or CIA for short, has long been invincible to the naked eye, but shrouded in indescribable mystery and controversy. Until recently, coups were seen as internal struggles, manifestations of a people who desire regime change. But to the contrary, they are often planned and legitimized from the outside and then projected as a sign of local instability. They are not sudden sharp actions. In fact, they are built on long-term processes to control geopolitical orders, financial networks, and natural resources. CIA covert operations are by their very nature hard to prove definitively, but research into the agency's work, declassified documents, as well as revelations by former CIA employees have unwound a complicated information web. This series will discuss African independence leaders who were ousted or assassinated by Western intelligence services. Congo's Patrice Lumumba's death in 1961 followed on from that of opposition leader of Cameroon, Felix Mumi, poisoned in 1960. Silvanas Olimpio, leader of Togo, was killed in 1963. Mehdi Ban Barka, leader of the Moroccan opposition movement, was kidnapped in France in 1965 and his body never found. Eduardo Mondlen, leader of Mozambique's Frelimo, fighting for independence from the Portuguese, died from a parcel bomb in 1969. And of course, Ghana's Kwame Nkrumah. This decade is the decade of African independence. So, you know, obviously, again, so I didn't make this video, uh, but obviously for copyright reasons, you have to interrupt when you're streaming other people's content, uh, especially if you're streaming it in full, um, because we're doing a critique anyway, right? Um, I, I want people to understand this, right? First off, you have to get it in your mind that America, right, is playing by a, a playbook. You know, it's playing by a playbook. It tells you. If you're a citizen here, it tells you. Might makes right. It's playing by this playbook. It's setting the tone for the, uh, for the, for the globe. And they're doing it uh, pretty much in front of your face. You have to, at some point, say to yourself, who are these people? What do they want? And what are they willing to do to get it? And... Do they respect African people? Once, you, once you're able to answer those questions, right? You as a people have to try to navigate yourself away from them. And not just white Americans. You know, uh, one, of the, one of the quotes that I, I guess I put it in the Discord, right? One of the quotes that I, I said it yesterday too, is... You know, we have this African proverb that goes, uh, um, when the tree, um, when the tree, let me see. Oh, yeah. When the axe came into the forest, the tree said, look, the handle is one of us. Right? And the thing is this. No, sorry. When the axe came into the forest, yeah, it said, look, the handle is one of us. Right? Um... <laughs> <laughs> so you, you're a forest of trees, and then you see an axe coming in, right? And you say, oh, we're, we're safe, guys. Don't worry, because the handle is one of us. Now, you're not supposed to. That's what I said yesterday. Or that's what I say in general. You're not supposed to look at the handle of the axe. You know, you if somebody's carrying an axe towards you, you don't look at the handle and say, it's just a piece of wood. It's just going to bonk me. You know, you, but here's another thing, too. You're not supposed to look at the blade either. Okay? You're not supposed to look at the blade and say, well, the blade is the problem because really the handle is, you know, the stick is just going to bonk me. So there's, so what, what is the next component you're supposed to look at? If it's not, if you're looking at the axe, you're not supposed to look at the handle. 
You're not supposed to look at the blade. What are you supposed to be looking at then? And because it's not an interactive program, <laughs> you're supposed to look at the handler. The person carrying the axe. Because, see, if, 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 if my good buddy is carrying the axe, it's not a threat to me. Right? If my good buddy is carrying the axe, it's not a threat to me. But if my enemy is carrying the axe, then it is. So the forest and the and the axe and the handle and all that kind of stuff, the forest is not supposed to look at uh, the handle and be like, well, you know, uh, I mean, they're, they're, they're good, they're safe. Because you're going to see Nkrumah has this story um, regarding African-American um, an ambassador who obviously sabotages um, Ghana, right? But you're supposed to look at the handler. Who does this African American, if you will, work for? Who is who is responsible for their paycheck? Who's responsible for their livelihood? Because one of the things you have to understand about the people is that if you are not responsible for their livelihood, if they do not owe you for their existence, guess what? They don't have loyalty for you. Nine times out of ten. Okay? Nine times out of ten, they do not have loyalty to you. Uh, the, the only... Like I said, there, there, there are bonds in this world. There are bonds that um, uh, reflect... Uh, Bonds, bonds really are imaginary. Even the bonds of a family are imaginary. You understand? The, the only real thing you have is you. I'll be honest with you. Now, you might not want to hear that. You might not like that. You might not agree with it. But it's true. The only thing you have is you. Now, this is why I said you want imagination to reflect reality. Who is helping you and who is hurting you? Those are the questions you have to come across. People don't owe you shit. People don't owe you anything in real life. But they may, if, if they feel like, hey, you know what? You've, you benefit me. You know, I realize, you know, like I said, in, in Africa, a couple of women, are, you know, some of them are interested in me, obviously, because I'm helpful. Because I'm helpful. And they're interested in me to the extent that I can be helpful to them. And they will be nice to me in kind based upon and in proportion to how helpful I am. And they don't like hurtful men, obviously. And they don't like men who do not help them, obviously. And this is the way of the world. But they don't owe me anything. And I, I see that um, clearly. And I communicate that, obviously. But, but this is what we have to come to terms with, is that uh, bonds, everything, just, it's just imaginary, right? Um, Light bear, um, naturally spiritual, says, hi, how are you today? I appreciate that. <laughs> I appreciate that. Uh, I appreciate the affection. <laughs> but, but, but let's... Uh, <laughs> you'll, be, you'll be giggling like a schoolgirl, right? <laughs> And I'm like, what? I don't even understand that. But um, why I am uh, why I'm pointing this out? That's a good thing it's not on the screen, right? <laughs> but anyway, but why is it that? Um, so yeah, I mean, we have to understand about the uh, the bonds and how people will um, act. Now, let's connect this with America, right? America doesn't owe you anything. At least the American doesn't owe you anything if you're a black in America. It owes you less if you're black in Africa. You know, Light Bear says I love the topic. Yeah, exactly. The U.S. is a fucking uh, U.S. is a is awful, right? Um, it owes you less if you are in Africa. Yet, we as African people, especially in Africa, are constantly inviting. America into our uh, our midst, you know, and constantly and time after time, we talking Cindy Lauper, right? <laughs> time after time, America is killing 
and, and devastating and dis stealing and destroying on African soil. At some point, we have to say to ourselves, learn. We have to say to ourselves, learn. Now, I might have went on a tangent, but let's uh, go back. Oh, also, I, saw, I found the video. I don't know how to show it, though. It's that graphic card update. Forward then to independence. To independence now. Tomorrow, the United States of Africa. As Kwame Nkrumah, Ghana's founding father, as well as Africa's first post-colonial president south of the Sahara would come to learn, this is the kind of thing one has to plan almost in secret and launch when ready, because as soon as you say it, you'll have a target on your back. From the moment that Nkrumah ascended to power, the CIA's eyes were tracking him and what was happening in Ghana from far away Langley, Virginia. Nkrumah's ideologies were rooted in his vision of a United States of Africa. He believed that the only way for Africa to truly progress was through the creation of a federal state based on a common market, common currency, a unified army and a common foreign policy that would enable Africa to solve internal conflicts as well as defend itself against external threats. Ghana's independence from Britain... So I want people to hear what he said about what Pan-Africanism looks like for Nkrumah. And, and this is why also I think that it might behoove or it might be for us, right? <laughs> Somebody said I'll use the word behoove, right? But anyway, I'm just like, I'm just avoiding that. Um, but this is why I say that it is very critical for, for us to propagate these African visionaries. The word is visionary, right? These visionary presidents. I'm going to, I think I'm going to look through the literature of five of them. Right? Call him the top five, if you will. Uh, technically, I'm going to include Garvey, even though he wasn't really a president, but he was, you know. Um, either way, right? You have Nkrumah. You have Thomas Sankara. You have Amilcar Cabral. And you have Julius Nader. Okay? The thing about a human being is that we have imagination. Not to say that nothing else has imagination, but we do. But we have imagination. Right? And because we have imagination, one of the things we want to judge a person by, first and foremost, is their deeds, their actions, their activity, but second of all, their ideas, their imagination, their vision. And these African leaders had very good vision. Now, uh, we had a brother on Twitter who said, hey, man, if only um, you know, Kuma and Eric could have sat down. You know, the trouble is that your vision is not going to be the next man's vision. And your job is to recruit people into your vision or be recruited into somebody else's vision. Right? Um, but visions clash. Okay? Visions clash. So in Krumah's vision uh, of, of this federated state, of all the African states, and, you know, was different from Nyerere's vision of, let's just do the East African Confederate, like, let's do the East African community right now. And the two of them clash. This is why I like, you know, East Side. Nere more than I like Nkrumah. All the same. Hear what Nkrumah said about uh, the uh, collective army. Hear what he said about the uh, uh, the negotiations abroad. Hear what he said about uh, you know internal squabbles being being squashed by our own people. That is something that we really should propagate among our continental brothers and sisters. And it's straight out of the continental brothers and sisters themselves. We have to uh, get this sort of visionary outlook there. Actually, you know, matter of fact, I see um, um, Kagame in the, on, on the side. Maybe we should put K Kagame, because um, he's a real president. Um, although I love Marcus Garvey. Um, you know, we really should probably just keep the visionary presidents to the visionary um, presidents, you know? Um, but either way, you know, scouring the literature of our African um, ancestors and and really examining it would be um, a starter for 
uh, us as a people to to really seriously move forward. You see the stupid video card. Colonial rule in 1957 was not only significant for Ghana, but also for the rest of the continent. Consistent with his Independence Day declaration that Ghana's independence was meaningless unless it was linked with the total liberation of the entire continent, Nkrumah trained African liberation fighters, financed their movements, and encouraged them to send colonialists parking from their territories. It is no wonder that in less than a decade after Ghana's independence, more than 35 African countries also attained their own independence. It is also no wonder that according to some quarters, he had to be taken out. Now, I do want people to realize what he said, and I kind of hate that the stupid freaking video won't load right after I press part play, but um, financing other revolutionary leaders or focusing your foreign policy on freeing African people, that was Nkrumah's um, agenda. That was Nkrumah's MO. Uh, that is... Brilliant. That is how it's done. And and understanding that that's how it's done, you have to then pull back and say to yourself, okay, that's what America's doing too. But with a bigger purse. You know? And it, and it, and it, and it, and it becomes, it, and it's, it's for us as a people that we keep in mind, like we bear in mind that you have to have in your mind that America's up to no good. You know, there's this video, in fact, of this, uh, there's this video of this, um, uh, what do you call it? This guy talking about how he was offered a certain amount of money for his land, right? Guy on the continent, you know? Regular villager. He said, hey, I was offered this much for the land, right? And he said, the reason, so he's like, well, because, well, he said he refused. And they said, why did you refuse that offer for the land, which was a significant amount of money? And he said, well, if somebody's trying to buy my land for, you know, let's say X amount of money, then it has to be worth more than X amount of money. Okay? Because specifically if you're buying something like land or you're buying something about, um, yeah, if you're buying anything that's a productive asset, Right? It has to be worth more than you're trying to pay buy it for. Now, granted, can you convert that worth? Probably not. Hey, can you convert that value? Probably not. Um, and granted, um, it might not necessarily be worth uh, um, much more than what they're offering. But the reality is that people are offering you... Uh, they're, 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 they're usually going to... Now, I don't want to say they lowball you... But they're usually going to uh, give you something. Uh, they're usually going to give you something in order to get more later. Okay? So, one part of political consciousness that you have to really establish in the minds of African people is America's back. Because... When you go into trade with America, right, America's going to, let's just, for lack of a better word, lowball you. Or America's going to offer you something at market value. And, but that the cost associated with market value is that much more detrimental. You're going to see what happens to Ghana after Nkrumah's taken out. What happens to Ghana after Nkrumah's taken out? And so the soldiers who 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 financed, uh, so who 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 accepted the American currency for the coup, right? Permitted the loss and devastation of African people, and that's always what it's going to be. That's always what it's going to be, because again, Wazungu has no reason to respect you, and and two, you have to compare the size of your nation. To the size of America's nation, you have to compare uh, and, and America's network and America's 
essentially America is the is is an elder state. Um, and 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 you you know again, <laughs> so these countries are like five years, you know, seven years old, and, and America's you know doing what it's fucking doing. Um, but again, you see, Nkrumah was doing it. But again, Nkrumah was a five year country dealing this with two year countries, right? America is like a three hundred year country, um, uh, with 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 with, <laughs> like it's just with a huge ass network, uh. It's it's almost ridiculous, you know, and 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 I really I want to stress in the IRA. You guys can read this in the um, Book of Power. When the IRA was talking about how you can't be, uh, like you have to pay attention to weight classes, you know, uh, when a when a lightweight goes into the boxing ring with a heavyweight, it is called murder, and and this is exactly what America is up to in this world today. I think I'll press play. By any means necessary, Nkrumah's efforts to unite Africa under one government and his anti-imperialist stance attracted the resentment of the West, particularly the United States. In his book, Dark Days in Ghana, Nkrumah alleged that the CIA and other intelligence agencies were actively plotting to undermine his government, using bribes and premises of political power to recruit traitors in his government. Although his critics dismissed these claims as delusional, declassified documents later proved that the CIA had orchestrated the plot to get rid of the man who, according to the files, did more to undermine American interests than any other black African. The I U.S. Said. government was determined to get rid of Nkrumah before he managed to unite Africa under one government. They worked with senior Ghanaian military and police officers, supported by British and American diplomats and intelligence officers who provided long-term planning, financing and logistical aid to mastermind Nkrumah's ouster. The U.K. and the U.S. began discussions of regime change in Ghana in 1961, a whole five years before its actual execution. Details of plans... So again, you know, and this is the thing that you, you got to realize, these people, five years ahead of time. And I think that was, I'm not even sure, but I look like that was Kennedy, right? So... <laughs> okay, so Kennedy... Okay, if you guys don't know who Kennedy is, which is pretty interesting. Like, I didn't even peep that the first time I saw the video. So, I, I, I don't know how many people peeped it. But let's talk about Kennedy. Kennedy is considered one of those, like, like, like the friend of black people. You understand? The friend of black people. The, the new guy. And, you know, this is the, this is the trick, the okie doke that is pulled off on us. You know, another... You know, I'm not going to say, I'm not going to do that. All right. Like, basically the Obama before Obama, right? Just not, you know, half black, right? Uh, Kennedy was the, you know, the, the young, you know, I'm smiling at you. I can shake your hand. I talk smooth. I say witty things, you know, groomed to be president. Kind of, like I said, Obama, right? And you know how Obama has that flair, that celebrity, that that uh, that sort of so forth. This is, uh, but this is during the two thousand era, the internet era. Before that was the, um, you know, I guess the sixties. You know, and you have this new guy who's whatever, and yet he's engaging with. It looks like the same motherfucker, Prince Charles. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't. I don't want to rewind per se, but it looks like it might have been the same motherfucker who just who's like the king of England right now. I don't know. But, um, uh, yeah, he's plotting and planning uh, with these people to overthrow the Ghanaian leader who just came into power. Who just got ahead of the nation state. And, and, it, and, it, and, it, and, it, and, it, and this is, this is one of the things that we have to, as a, a people, understand. That they were plotting to sabotage Nkrumah. From jump. And they were there in the country for five, six years with plans and motives to overthrow the guy. And yet, 
Even today, our people would still say, let's get some friends among the African Americans, let's get some friends among the white Americans, let's get some friends among the Americans. Why? The handle, the axe, the handler. Pay attention. They are in your country plotting for your demise nine times out of ten. And, and they're supposed to. You know, again, you have to judge a person by two things, their deeds and their vision. And the thing is this, even if America didn't have any sort of deeds, what was America's vision? Was it a pan-African state? This is why, like I said, never are you going to hear me um, uh, disrespecting, um, like, n never will you hear me, um, no, I shouldn't say never, but basically what I was, what I would say is that when I look at history, I respect Stalin and I respect Mao. And today I respect Putin and I respect Xi Jinping as men. I respect these four men as men. And I respect uh, Kagame as men. Now, why do I say that? Because Stalin said, it takes, you have to crack the eggs to make an omelet. That's what he said. If you have a serious ideology, right? You have to, you have a serious vision. You have to know who is against it and you have to get rid of them. And that's, unfortunately, like I said, Nkrumah was playing the same game. He was saying the same game. He was financing revolutionary leaders around Africa who were, who were about that, about it, about it. You know, who were about the Pan-African um, objective. And unfortunately, Nkrumah might have sabotaged an effort by Nirere because they had a different vision. That's why I don't really mess with Nkrumah for that. But the reality is this, if you as Nkrumah, five years in power, two years in power, whatever, if you are able to pull off all this sort of geopolitical machinations with the little money you have, why in the world would you have America in your border? If you know what you could do, like if, if I know what I could do with, or let's say this, if I, if I go up to, if I say to myself, hey, look, man, with uh, $500 in my pocket, I could get any, um, I could get just about any woman. Right? You know, for one night, let's say. Let's just pretend, if that's my mentality. $5, why in the world would I let a guy with, <laughs> with $5,000 in his pocket to spend for, 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 for Paul Paul, if you will, why would I let him into my house with my daughter? You know what I'm saying? Or my wife, or my, or my sister, or my, my mother, or my grandmother. Why the fuck would I let this motherfucker in my house? If I know what I could do with 500 bucks, why would I let this guy in with $5,000, $50,000? You, you got to understand. And this is why, like I said, I respect Mao and I respect Stalin because they said, look, we're closing the door to you fucking Americans. That's what you have to do. You have to say, look, I'm closing the door to these stupid fucking Americans. Because they're the fucking problem. Nine times out of ten. Even today, we have what's going on in Sudan. I should have played that video. But what's going on in Sudan is that Russia, uh, uh, Sudan and Russia make a deal. They say, hey, look, you know, we can, uh, you know, you're allowed in our ports. You're allowed in our ports. And again, you know, you might be like, well, what about having Russia? In your, you know, why would you allow Russia? Just calm down for a second, right? Here's what happens. You allow, you allow Russia because you're a free fucking person. Just like you allow America because you're a free fucking person. Um, but you have to understand who America is, right? But either way, you allow America in or you allow Russia in because you're a free person, right? America has a vision, right? A, a vision of they're going to fucking take you over, okay? Russia doesn't have that same vision per se, right? Or at least you could say... Like, you know, you, you, you don't see any evidence of it, right? Uh, just to say, China, you don't see any evidence of it. You could fathom, you could imagine that there's that there's a real threat of America who does have that vision of taking you over. And then there's the imagined, like, maybe you're just like the American. I don't know. Regardless, if you think they're just like the American, why the fuck are you letting the Americans in? 
What, like, like, why? And, 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 uh, like, like, if you think the American, like, come on, use your fucking brain. But, but regardless, let me, let me just, let me, let me not, let me not cuss too much, you know. Um, I don't know. I'm trying to sound Caribbean, but I can't. But either way, um, you, you, you have this. Uh, so you, you, you allow the American in, whatever, right? So what's going on in Sudan is this: the Russians, you know, have a deal to build a port and all that kind of stuff. The Americans don't like it. Okay, why you don't like these Sudanese people making their own decisions? I don't know, but you don't. So you know what they do? Cool. They go and they fight in Khartoum and they kill a bunch of African people, slaughtering them for what? Just so that they can have a like, just so they can, just just for them. The most selfish, disrespectful, disdainful population on the or nation on the fucking world. Those are the Americans. And yet, you as an African people, you have to say to yourself, stop. It's not worth it. If you, because you, you, look, we already went over how much Nkrumah lost, but this brother um, doing this, this, uh, this, 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 this podcast or whatever, or this video, they, they give, like, they give even more. Like, they give even more reason. They just solidify it. And this is why I said you should translate this video um, into, into Swahili. But let's keep going. And like I said, this video card thing, but you guys, you guys get it by now. I'll probably, you know, ask something. Uh, Real Black Gentleman says, hey, yo, hey, yo, hey, yo. We're just waiting for this stupid video to play. Wait. Are we waiting for this from video? this time are mostly unknown since declassified documents from this period remain censored. According to the U.S. State Department at the time, Nkrumah's overpowering desire to export his brand of nationalism unquestionably made Ghana one of the foremost practitioners of subversion in Africa. He resisted economic policies proposed by the International Monetary Fund and reasserted by the World Bank. He was patron to a Bureau of African Affairs, which allegedly had agents supporting nationalist and opposition movements across Africa, like the Ivory Coast, Upper Volta, now Burkina Faso, Niger, Togo, Senegal, Cameroon, Liberia and Nigeria, with the ultimate goal of assisting more radical leaders to get to positions of power. He even mounted an offensive against apartheid South Africa, providing money and training to the military wing of the African National Congress. In the years leading to the coup, Washington withheld loans to Ghana and worked to lower world cocoa prices through stockpiling in order to deprive Nkrumah of much-needed foreign exchange. So, all right, just, just to clarify, do you see how much you can accomplish when you accomplish, when you achieve a nation? You know, like, like I said, I'm almost embarrassed because I was like, hey, man, these are the five visionary African presidents and, you know, let's include Garvey, right? And it's like, no, when you are a president, you can accomplish so much. He is able to finance multiple revolutionary leaders, multiple pro-African leaders in, in Africa from his little state of Ghana. But... Knowing what he can do, what does that mean America could do? What does that mean Americans' agents could do? And the thing is this, America has, a, <laughs> has an agent, uh, I can't remember the name, they're going to talk about it, I, I don't remember the name of it, but like they have like a headquarters in Ghana. And I'm not saying, I don't know if it was like officially, you know, oh, this is the agent headquarters kind of thing, I don't know, I don't know, but... Because, uh, again, there was recently news of a Chinese, um, you know, spy cell here in New York City that just kind of operated, like, pretended to be a, a document, you know, you know, notary, notary of Republic or something. And it was really, you know, pressuring people to return to China to get their heads chopped off or something. I don't know. But um, so I'm not going to say that. I don't know if they were operating openly in um, Ghana. But, you know, these are the things you got to be mindful of. Is that if you are a revolutionary and you have a revolutionary objective, you have a pan-African objective, you have a pro-African objective, right? Why in the world do you have America in your in your in your backyard? Like why do you have America in your fucking yard, in fact? Why? Why why? 
If you're turning down the IMF and the World Bank and, and America's pissed about it, right? Because you're going to see that even Nkrumah goes and America's like, hey, you want to go negotiate some peace in Vietnam? And, America, and Nkrumah's like, yeah, sure, why not? Why the fuck are you even thinking? Wait, whoa, whoa. You, you want to go uh, negotiate some peace in Vietnam? Yeah, I could do that. Then he loses his fucking kingdom. He loses his nation right then. It's like, why the fuck? I can't even. Like, 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 what part of that made sense is my question. Well, I'm, I'm jumping ahead of myself, but like, yeah, let's let's just go. I'm gonna update this. I don't know what to do with this video card, but I'm gonna update it. U.S. Ambassador Franklin Williams, one of the first African-Americans African ambassador, had presented his credentials to Nkrumah on January 17, 1966, a few weeks to the coup. But before taking up his position, he exchanged private correspondences with friends, bragging that he would soon be running the country. You hear this shit though? No, I don't even, I don't even think people hear what I'm saying. So this African-American guy is bragging about how he's going to take over an African country. And if you realize how many Africans are killed in this attack, right? You have to turn back. You have to come back to yourself and say to yourself, what good is it opening your doors? What good is it? Now, Nkuma may have had some sort of suspicion from this, right? And Kua may have some sort of suspicion from this, but at the same time, right? <laughs> Actually, I just made that little, <laughs> I just recorded that so the uh, people in Africa. But anyway, but at the same time, we have to ask ourselves, like, if it, like, 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 <sighs> you have to get over black America. And I tell you guys this, because Cindy Lauper, time after time, you have to get over black America. You have to, you know, and, and, and I'm going to be explicit. You got to, like, like I told you guys in another video, you got to get, uh, get over Malcolm X, get over, uh, Nilly Fuller Jr. Get over Amos Wilson. Just get over them. Now, granted, those are not individuals who, uh, uh, you know, were up to the fuck shit that this guy was up to, obviously, right? Even Nilly Fuller, who's still alive. You know, he's kind of harmless, not threatening, all that kind of stuff, right? Um, but if you get enamored in this pop with this population in a nation, right, you're not paying attention to who the fucking handlers are. Yes, a handful of us could say, oh, we don't have this white boy as a handler. Sure. But here's the thing that, I, you know, this person who's the fucking ambassador to America cannot say. America's a damn handler. The guy collects his paycheck from America. What? What is? What could possibly possess you? Now, see again, like me personally, no, obviously, you know. I mean, I'm not saying that I don't ever, you know, receive a paycheck because that sounds like, you know, bum energy, right? <laughs> but what I'm going to say is, you know, yeah, me, I can do whatever the fuck I want, you know, technically, right? And I got no fucking allegiance to this fucking country, okay? But a fucking diplomat? What the fuck you, like, what? And, and, and of course you might say, well, diplomats are just a normal part of the world. Obviously, yeah, sure. Don't include, don't fucking shake their, don't, don't, j -j 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 snub them. Like right now, I'm, I'm talking to this, uh, you know, sister in Africa. I don't know what I did, but she's, you know, she's upset with me or something. She's snubbing me like I'm a damn whatever. And that's perfectly understandable. That's perfectly understandable. That's what you're supposed to do if you don't, if something's gone wrong or something, or even just knowing the relationship. I don't know, whatever. Point is this. This guy is privately bragging, oh, I'm going to take over this country. I'm going to kill their president. I'm going to kill their guards. I'm going to kill a bunch of African people, and I'm going to sit there and smile and do what the white boy wants from me. And 
And and part of the only reason why he could do that is because you have some sort of sympathy for the African Americans. You know? Only reason. Or you have some sort of sympathy for white people, generally. You know? And see, look, Real Black Gentleman says, hey, international sambos ruining their own peoples. Yeah. And, and the thing is this, too. But you got to realize this, too. I want to say this. These people do not see other people as their people. And, 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 and this is why I say I don't even go into race only. I don't go into class only. And I don't necessarily go into nation only, but I do emphasize nation. I think you have to emphasize the nation. Who is this person loyal to? Because I learned that the hard way when I was younger. When I was younger, I said to myself, look, I don't need to be no man. I don't need to be. I, all the thing I need to do is work for this political party here in New York City. New York City had a political party called the Freedom Party. We were working towards it. We put up in front of us the gubernatorial candidate. Um, by the way, my the, the, the leader of that movement, he recently passed, um, Alton H. Maddox. But Alton H. Maddox put uh, forward Charles Barron as the gubernatorial candidate. Charles Barron was this uh, city councilman, right? Very, you know, electric speaker. He knows how to talk the talk and all that kind of stuff. Um, and all that kind of jazz. And he's still accepted into the black community as a radical and revolutionary speaker. He's a city councilman. Again, remember that. He's a city councilman. Right? So, when it came time that we, we, we got on the ballot, we got enough signatures, we walked around, the, you know, around New York trying to get signatures, and then finally we got enough signatures that we could be on the ballot. We got on the ballot. We had maybe, let's say... 20,000 signatures and we got like 5,000 votes. We didn't believe that was a fair amount of, we didn't believe that was, because we needed like maybe 15, 30,000 votes in order to become a permanent political party, right? But we got 5,000 votes and the police said, shut the fuck up, suck it, right? Or even this, they said, the only way that you could challenge the vote in order to get a recount was to, if your gubernatorial candidate asked for it. Basically, Oni couldn't ask for it. Maddox couldn't ask for it. Only the gubernatorial candidate could ask for it. And the gubernatorial candidate, Charles Barron, said, I'm not asking for that shit. And it, and it became clear to Maddox. Maddox said, oh, okay. I knew the guy was a snitch. I knew the guy was a police agent. But I didn't know he was that bad. And that's when I kind of withdrew from the movement. Because I was like, so you knew this motherfucker was a snitch? You knew he was a police agent? You knew he was a Democrat? Because he was a Democrat. You knew he was a Democrat. I mean, he, I mean, everybody knew he was a Democrat. But you knew that he had loyalty to the Democratic Party. But you thought, oh, well, he's going to be loyal to the race. No. You have to look at a person based off of, uh, of, of, of their nation, based off of their political party, based off of their ideology, their vision, based off of who their handler is. This is how you look at a person. And so I learned at a young age because I put my I put myself into that. I said, "Oh, I'm going to give these African Americans a political party. I'm going to help in achieving and accomplishing. I'm going to work for this political party so that we can have what we need. Also, if you will, they can have what they need. But we were sabotaged by an African American that's still beloved in the community today. It said to me, was said to me, just, just stupid." It's just stupid. But yes, the loyalty, the loyalty, but you have to look at a person based off their political party. You have to look at the person based off their nation and so on and so forth. And this gentleman, I shouldn't say gentleman, but this, this crook is not going to be loyal to the Ghanaian people. This crook is not going to, so you don't open your hands and say, well, you're a black man, so you're going to be loyal to the Ghanaian people. No, he's going to be loyal to the African Americans, maybe. He's going to be loyal to the Americans, definitely. He's going to be a, a loyal to the Democratic Party in America, absolutely. And if you're not a Democrat in America, then he's not going to be looking out for you. And that's just damn common sense, but we... But it just runs short because you get you get you get uh, you get absorbed into oh well he's an African American ah those African Americans you guys were oppressed you understand how the white man is you don't like them either if you didn't, if they didn't like them they would have left 
You know what I'm saying? If they didn't like them, they would have left. I mean, it's, it's, it's really that simple. Now, obviously, I'm not saying that it's easy to leave. I'm not saying it's so on and so forth. But you would have left, or you definitely wouldn't have escalated into the fucking government and became an ambassador to Ghana. Ellie's here. Ellie says, hey. Hey, Ellie. Um, but yeah, that, like, like, you, like, like, there's certain things that we have to know as common sense. And, and, and it cost us. This cost us. This mistake cost us. Because you see, Nkuma, he, I think he, I'm not sure, I'm not, I don't remember 100%, but I think he went down to, uh, he went to America and he, he bonded with African Americans. He bonded with Kwame Nkuma, uh, with uh, John Harry Clark and so on and so forth. And he, he bonded with Carlos Cooks and he bonded with Kwame Ture and them. Williams' associations with U.S. intelligence and the coup were a more disturbing brand of betrayal, considering Nkuma's Pan-Africanism and his call for Ghana to be a haven for black artists, thinkers, and leaders. Three weeks to the coup, an editorial in The Spark, a newspaper founded by Nkrumah, asked why the U.S. would send an African-American ambassador to Ghana when they did not support racial equity in their own country and would surely not send a black ambassador to a European nation. There was speculation that Nkrumah saw his appointment as a sign of disrespect and felt that the U.S. was sending a black ambassador to do their dirty work. And he did. On February 21st, 1966, Three days to the coup, Nkrumah went on a state visit to Vietnam to negotiate a peaceful settlement to the U.S. war in Vietnam. The United States had encouraged him to go on the diplomatic mission and indeed promised to halt the bombing of North Vietnam in order to ensure his safety. And you see how these journalists are all standing around making it look like this is a legitimate and intelligent thing that, that Nkrumah is doing? Hey, Nkuma, wow, you're going to go negotiate the peace in Vietnam? Uh, why, we're so grateful. We're going to send a whole, you know. And these, these journalists are really pulling, pull, like that. They're, they're, they're taking videos, man, smiling, chuckling, chucking, and jiving. <laughs> and I respect this, brother. Like I said, the next book I plan to read is Challenge of the Congo. They said that that was the book that put him on the map. But um, that put him on the U.S. map. But I, I don't know. I don't know per se. But I, was, I have it right here. And I, I, was, I was actually going to put on my webcam to um, show off the book. But, you know, I don't know how to prop it up and all that kind of crap. But um, why I'm saying this is that you see him smiling, shucking, you know, oh, yeah, man, look at me. I'm, I'm doing something great for the world. Yeah, sure, sure. You just lost your fucking country. Because you listen to America to go negotiate a peace in Viet fucking Nam? For what? Like, 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 what part of, like, what? Like, and, and see, my thing is that if it was like the Congo asked you to go and negotiate a peace in in South Africa. Okay, makes a little bit more fucking sense. America asked you to go all the way down to Asia, and you said, sure, I'll do that. How? How? Why? Oh, we're going to have a bunch of footage. We're going to hold off the bombing of Vietnam. We are actively bombing Vietnam, and we want you to negotiate the damn peace. You're the fucking peaceless one. It's your fucking war. You're the one who could just pull your soldiers out. Like, what are you fucking talking about? And then you go to me, Ghana. And then what happens? He goes there and he loses his damn country. I, I'm sorry, I, I, I played a little ahead of time, but it's come on, it's just like it's just you, you just you just how are you supposed to feel about this? Because this this is a, this is I mean, again, you know, you could say, hey man, this guy was a misogynist. Yeah, he was. Right? You could say this was uh you know this guy sabotaged the very yeah absolutely right. But it was still a good man. An intelligent man. You, you, you guys saw, I read Conscientism for you guys. That's an intelligent book. Difficult. Mathematical. Brilliant. And yet here you have, you know, because, and, and you saw, I don't know if you guys peeped it. I didn't pause it at that point. But, you know, he's like, I want this. I want God to be a hub for black thinkers and black radicals, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, he has his, his Du Bois, a fucking spy, another one, right? And he has, he has Dr. King showed up. And Dr. King's a good man. Dr. King's a good man. I'm just saying, why are you so fucking obsessed with the fucking Americans? Leave them the fuck alone. Sure, make it a good place for them, sure. But, again, you have the American ambassador, you have motherfucking Du Bois who sabotaged Marcus fucking Garvey. I shouldn't say Marcus fucking Garvey. But Marcus Garvey. Like, come on. You're enamored by a population that 
when, when, when you, you had so much going for you. You had so much going for you. Like you're, you're financing revolutionary leaders across Africa. You're, you're liberating a continent. You have so much going for you, but you still say to yourself, wow, that Amos Wilson's a good speaker. Yeah, he's a good speaker. Yeah, Malcolm X is a cool guy. You know? Yeah, Nelly Fuller Jr. has an interesting viewpoint on white supremacy. But come on. Leave them the fuck alone. Because what you have to lose is much is far greater than what you have to gain. You know, the risk, the reward does not match the risk. You're playing with fire. You're playing with another people's country. You're playing with a powerful people's country. You understand? Like, we have to realize that even if you like African Americans, they are a part of a powerful, powerful, fucking sadistic, malicious, terrible country. And you're playing with that for no damn reason. For no damn reason. No, I'd really like it if, uh, if we can get Malcolm X out here. Okay, yeah, sure you can get Malcolm X out here, but you gotta take these students too. Those students are gonna be putting fucking bombs in your pillow. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so when you put your head out for sleep, they're gonna, they're gonna fucking lose your damn head. Because of that, I'm telling you. Shaking my damn head. Let's see what the comments are like. Ellie says, hey. Hey, right, fam, what y'all thinking? Meanwhile, back home, a group of 600 soldiers stationed in the northern part of the country was ordered to start moving south to Accra, a distance of about 435 miles or 700 kilometers. They were told at first that they were moving 600. to respond to the situation in southern Rhodesia. When they reached the capital, the coup leaders told the soldiers that Nkrumah was meeting with Vietnam President Ho Chi Minh in preparation for a deployment of Ghanaian soldiers to the Vietnam War. Later, the soldiers were told they were going to be deployed in southern Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe, to fight against the white government of Ian Smith. So the coup plotters riled up the soldiers and justified their takeover by charging that Nkrumah's administration was abusive and corrupt. They explained that they were disturbed by Kwame Nkrumah's aggressive involvement in African politics and by his belief that Ghanaian troops could be sent anywhere in Africa to fight so-called liberation wars, even though they never did so. Above all, they pointed to the absence of democratic practices in the nation, a situation they claimed had affected morale of the armed forces. The soldiers were divided up and led to capture various key government installations. The state broadcasting house and the international communication buildings were captured quickly. The heaviest fighting broke out at the Flagstaff House, which was the presidential residence. But when Colonel E.K. Kokota threatened to bomb the presidential residence, if resistance continued, Nkrumah's wife, Fadia Nkrumah, advised the guards to surrender. The coup leaders informed the public of the regime change over the radio at dawn on February 24, 1966. And you see that. Now, again, I'm not going to blame the Egyptian lady. Um, she said uh, she told them to surrender. Um, and, you know, like, again, you can't really blame the Egyptian lady. Now, somebody might say, well, you know, it's the reason, you know, because, like, I don't know why the fuck they're listening to the Egyptian lady anyway. Uh, but, again, Nkrumah brings the Egyptian lady in. So, no, no, no. I shouldn't even say Nkrumah brings the Egyptian lady in. You know who brings the Egyptian lady in? An African American. Which African American? W. B. Du Bois. <laughs> like, come on. Like, come on. And again, I got nothing against African Americans. Um, I do not like Du Bois. He's a although you know I wouldn't call him a sedentist because again he's mixed and I think his wife was mixed, right? But I do not like uh, Du Bois, and I might have called him a sedentist before, but again I didn't. Um, I didn't know his wife was mixed. Um, and also, like, again, he is himself uh, mixed, so, um, you know, it is what it is. Like, who gives a shit? Uh, but, and of course, the, you know, it's Du Bois. I want people to understand this, too. It's only in America where Du Bois is accepted as a black man. You understand? It's only in America. Which is the weirdest thing. 
Because, like, again, because because Kwame Nkrumah are pan-Africanists who wants the black world and all that kind of stuff, you know, all that, right? Not only does he marry an Egyptian lady who's clearly not black, per se, although, I don't know. Look, again, she's, she's, she's I don't know. Actually, I don't know her background. I don't know what part of Egypt. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think she's the Egyptian, you know, but it is what it is, right? Um, but why I, um, what I'm saying is this, right? This enamoring of America, this enamoring of Black America, this enamoring of the, of the white American propaganda. All right, I gotta turn off my uh, my ringtone for a second. <laughs> I sent people that uh, clip of me talking, and they they're all like, "What the fuck? Oh, you sound like a fucking." All right. <laughs> anyway, but that um, the clip of 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 African uh, of, of that. Why I'm saying this is this, right? It's in plain sight. America sends you away. And now all of a sudden you lose your whole nation. And for some reason, everybody's turned around to say, hey, what do we do, Miss Egyptian lady? And she's like, why don't you surrender? Now, again, her call to surrender when the other Africans are saying, we're going to bomb you. We're going to bomb our own people. Like, this is what the fucking Americans are doing. This is how the Americans look at you. And, 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 and what's, what's, what's sad or shameful, or, or and this is why America has this big-ass army, I want you guys to understand, is because 600 soldiers took over the, like, executed this coup. 600 soldiers. You know, I don't have a lot of people listening to me um, on this podcast right now, but I appreciate every last one of you, um, all four of you, <laughs> right? But, uh, 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 but, okay, five. Shout out to the fifth person. Um, but what? But what? I, why I'm saying is that 600. Why do I emphasize 600? Is because that's a tiny number. You know, if we're talking about, I think yesterday we were talking about Kevin Samuels a little bit. Not really, but um, one of the brothers brought him up, right? And he was like, "Hey, uh, you know, at any given day, Kevin Samuels would have, I don't know, twenty thousand people listening to him, listening to dog black women on any given day." 20,000 soldiers. No, 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 not that these people are soldiers. But what I'm saying is that not even that many people who were listening to Kevin Samuels on that fucking day that he's dogging black women, right? Uh, you, like with that many soldiers, you could take over a damn African country. And now I'm not saying go and take over an African country because that's not what you want to do. Um, I don't think so. I mean, unless that's what you want to do. I don't know. Um, uh, but Nkrumah had no damn defense set up and there was no sort of protocol. There was no sort of uh, leadership. There was no sort of sort of silver. And you give these motherfucking soldiers way too much damn power. But of course, you know, the might makes right and all that kind of stuff is in full effect. It's in full swing. You know, and, and you see, again, the I want to just go over some of the points that we, we skipped over. You know, how important imagination is. Because you put into these soldiers the head. You know, they put in these soldiers' minds. Oh, well, we don't have democracy. And, oh, he's sending us to Vietnam. And oh, he's sending us to uh, South Africa. And he's done none of things like that. He's done none of those things. But you can convince people. And that's enough. Imagination is enough. Manipulation, lies. That's what, that's what imagination... Imagination has its, has its roots in either you're telling the truth or you're telling a falsehood. It's either you're telling reality or you're telling uh, fiction. You know? Um, but either way, um, oh, I see. I'm shaking my damn head. Somebody, somebody so apparently they gave me the cold shoulder because I'm shaking my damn head. <laughs> I told them I still want to talk to them in May. And they're like, well, it's April, you know? And then they just misunderstood me. But anyway, but, uh, all right, let me just, sorry, I was just a little distracted. Um, uh, why I'm, I'm, uh, why I'm talking like this, I mean, sorry. So what I'm saying is that, oh, what was the third thing there? So there was the 600 soldiers, that was one part. Other part was the imagination of, of so on and so forth. Other part is, of course, how the freaking 
uh, wife of Nkrumah could suddenly make the call to surrender doesn't make any damn sense. Uh, and obviously, the other part is that you you know you you have no apparatus, you have no security apparatus to, to to defend yourself against these damn soldiers. They don't have the right political training for some damn reason. They're not fucking convinced with your political objectives for some damn reason. And then on top of this, uh, uh, like there's so there's so much that went fucking wrong. Uh, uh, Americans were, were were orchestrating this shit. For some damn reason, and 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 on top, and, and, and like that, like the 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 the, the nail in the coffin is why in the fuck were you in Vietnam? Like it, it doesn't even make any damn sense. And it, like I get that you thought you were the shit, you know, that you thought you were bound to be the president of Africa, right? You wanted to show up Nerere. And be like, no, Nerere, you can't be president of Africa because I'm in Kuma. I negotiated the damn peace treaty between America and, and China in Vietnam. And now you're sitting there exiled. You know, and that's the thing about Nkrumah that I realized that he had he kind of had a big ego. He kind of had a big ego. And maybe if I were to write a critical book or a critical examination of these ancestors, I might have to go into that. Now, the only reason why I might not include <laughs> Kagame, even though he's a great person, is that I don't want him to come back to me. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And Kuma can't get me. You know what I'm saying? And Kuma can't get me. I know you guys believe in spirits and spirits and, uh, 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 attacking you and shit, but and Kuma can't get me. Uh, Kagame could. Uh, I'm going to say that. <laughs> oh, sorry. I pressed, I pressed play on the wrong, on the wrong uh, video. Let's see. On the wrong screen. Y'all hear my heat coming up? Shit, yeah, boys. Six. On the ground, senior officials of the Ghana Army carried out the coup as the U.S. intelligence agency pulled the strings and called the shots from behind the scenes. The coup statement over the radio was as follows. Fellow citizens of Ghana, I have come to inform you that the military, in cooperation with the Ghana police, have taken over the government of Ghana today. The myth surrounding Kruma has been broken. Parliament is dissolved and Kwame Nkrumah is dismissed from office. All ministers are also dismissed. The ruling convention People's Party is disbanded with effect from now. It will be illegal for any person to belong to it. On the other side of the world in Vietnam, a 50 miles... You see that? He says, look, that's how you're supposed to do it, though. You're supposed to disband your opposition party. You're supposed to get rid of the opposition party. That's why, even though, like I said, I don't even... Like, like, like I know I just said I like Nkrumah. I mean, I like uh, um, Stalin. I like um, Mao. And... You know, technically, I should like these motherfuckers, too, because they disbanded the opposition political party as well. Okay? Uh, now, of course, I don't like them, because um, they're doing it in another motherfucking country. But, um, but like, that's what you're supposed to do. Again, the political party is the most important um, entity on, on the planet. Or the most important entity that you could be involved with as a political being. As a human being, the most important entity that you could be involved with is the motherfucking political party. Okay, is the particularly if you can the ruling party. Particularly if you can, sometimes he would be like, "Hey, man, you know that uh, these 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 banks they finance both sides of the war." Yeah, you finance the winner. Do 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 because the winner is going to say, "Oh, okay, you 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 could be here. You could you good? Oh, you good people." Like I said, I don't want to talk. Anything about? Cause I mean, I like Agame. You see what I'm saying? But I, but it, but let's say if I didn't like Agame, I would not step my foot in Rwanda and tell him that. Why would I do that? I'll be in Rwanda. Hey man, you know I don't like you guy. You know, hey, that's stupid. Somebody, but they would want that. They, they're like, yeah, man. I'll, you know, that's what I said. That's why. I, that's why I said about the, uh, um, you know, particularly here in America, it's like you know, a lot of us are convinced. Hey, you know what? <laughs> Fucking political parties are stupid. Political parties are dumb. They're all, they're all the same. All, if that's what you believe, then get the fuck out. 
This is why I like the coon, if you will. The, the coon is always, you know, in the Democratic plantation. Or the coon is in the Republican plantation. No! That's just, that's what you should do if you want to be intelligent. And, and 9 times out of 10, these quote-unquote coons are doing better than you because they're going for the political party in power. They're going for the ruling party. You're supposed to. When you're standing outside and you're not even involved in the political process, you're not involved with any political parties, you're not doing anything intelligent. You're not. You're sitting there broke as a joke. And you're like, I ain't going to do nothing with these political parties. They don't blow and trust none of them. Okay, that's fine. So what, so what are you going to do as a political being? If you want policy to be implemented, who are you going to go to? Who are you going to turn to? If you want, uh, like, like Marcus Garvey outlines this in message to the people. You know, message to the people might be another one of those books that you got to just translate into Swahili. My only issue with message to the people is obviously the religiosity. You know? Obviously the religiosity. You know, I might have to do an abridged version um, and all that kind of stuff. Um, but it is what it is. Anyway, hold on a second. Uh, but yeah, you know, I don't, yeah, whatever. We'll just go into it. But yeah, disband the enemy political party. An entourage accompanying Dotan Kruma ended up deserting him. A CIA telegram informed Washington of the coup and said the coup leaders appear to be implementing the plans they were reported earlier to have agreed on for the immediate post-coup period. According to the military, 20 members of the presidential guard had been killed and 25 wounded. Others suggest a death toll of 1,600. Whatever the number of the dead, it was far from the bloodless coup reported in the British press. After the coup, Nkrumah went into exile. He sought refuge from his close ally, Sekou Toure, the president of Guinea, who made him an honorary co-president of that country. An ex-CIA whistleblower stationed in Africa, John Stockwell, made comments about the role of the CIA in Nkrumah's downfall. Part of his account said, Howard Bain, who was the CIA station chief in Accra, engineered the overthrow of Kwame Nkrumah. Inside the CIA, it was quite clear. Howard Bain got a double promotion and was awarded intelligence star for the overthrow of Kwame. The magic of it was that Howard Bain had enough imagination and drive to run this operation without ever documenting what he was doing and there wasn't one shred of paper that was generated that would name the CIA hierarchy as being responsible. So look, I, I think it's pretty interesting. I, I want people to, I actually I did look at my phone, I got a little distracted. Somebody wrote something in Swahili, I was thinking about how can I translate it, so I got a little distracted. It's okay, right? But I remember this part. The man gets a fucking accolade for killing 1,600, close to 2,000 African people. He gets a fucking accolade in Virginia. This is your fucking ally. This is the people, this is the people that you, these are your friends. These are your friends. These are your close allies. These are the people that you believe are the, are the, are the, the best option for African people. You know, these are the, they, 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 they get a reward for killing a person, for killing 2,000, close to 2,000 African people. And for what? Because America doesn't like their policy. That's why, you know, yesterday we were talking to Shoot the Breeze and this brother was like, man, the Monroe Doctrine is still in effect. The, the, the Monroe is not the president. And America doesn't really get, only care about South America. America's fucking shit up. In Ghana, in Congo, in China, in, in Israel, in Palestine, in, 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 in Ukraine. You don't give a, it's not just a... Oh, well, I mean, America looks at the Monroe Doctrine. You gotta... You shut the fuck up. America's a damn nation. All of these nations are in all the other nations. China's in, in, in America. Russia is in China. Russia is in America. China's in Russia. China's in Ukraine. England is in... Ghana was in its neighbors. 
Uganda was in Uganda. I don't remember which one's Uganda. <laughs> I think it's one of these, right? But Ghana was in Uganda. That's how Ghana was able to sabotage the East African Federation. But 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 instead of but instead of instead of realizing, hey, you know what? But you gotta understand what's the vision, what's the imagination, what are they funding, what are they really trying to accomplish? What is their goal? What do they want? You have to look at a man and say, what does he want? Because cause see, cause see, here's the thing, here's the thing, here's the thing. Like I said, you, you got you gotta connect your imagination with reality. Please, 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 please. This is why I don't go with the religion. Because you're not connecting the imagination with reality. You have to go with imagination. You have to you have to link your imagination with reality. Okay? What I mean by that, right? Let me let me just make this recording again. What I mean by you have to link your imagination with reality is this, right? Let's say you're in Krumah and you want Africa to host a bunch of black intellectuals and black leaders and engineers and all that kind of stuff. You want you want that for your country. Does America want to produce a bunch of black intellectuals, leaders and radical and, and all that kind of stuff? If it does not want to do that, then why are you in an alliance with America? Or why are you taking orders from America? Why are you engaging America? That's what I want to know. Because if it does not want that, if it does not share your vision, if, if it's if your imagination is not is not compatible with their imagination, if their imagination is to suppress their own black population, then why in the world are you engaging America for, for any sort of reason? Especially if you don't have your shit together yet. Just sent that as a recording. Um, you know what I'm saying? That's what you got to do as a... Uh you know, content creators that you have to engage the world like that. But anyway, uh, why I'm saying that is that you you just you just can't. And and I, I anyway, I don't really see too many comments, so I'm just gonna keep going. What's my phone blowing up for? I want my flow. My phone just want to blow up. While Nkrumah's policies were seen as socialist-leaning and aligned with communist interests, his government did not take direct orders from the Soviet Union or China. In fact, he often criticized the Soviet Union for not doing enough to support African liberation movements. It became obvious when Krumah started promoting the African personality as a theme for self-governance. Under the purported lack of democracy excuse, they overthrew Nkrumah, which sent Ghana into a tailspin for decades. So, did conditions in Ghana get better after Nkrumah? This is the question that is never asked. Then consider this irony. We are to assume that the US and the UK had so much love for Ghana that they had the moral obligation to free her of Nkrumah's tyranny. Did the coup and the many others that followed result in achieving the ideals that were purportedly lacking under Nkrumah? Instead, we saw a culture of military brutalities and parades of military-style executions. After the coup, the International Monetary Fund rubbed salt to injury by sending a delegation to Accra to tell the military junta to discontinue Nkrumah's industrialization program, which they did. Look at this. And as a reward, some of them got airports named after them. The U.S. Embassy had long played up Nkrumah's alleged economic mismanagement and poor human rights record. Although it tolerated a higher number of political prisoners among the military junta which succeeded him and worse economic outcomes, the National Liberation Council that took over worked towards privatization of state-owned businesses, enabling the restoration of foreign dominance over Ghana's economy. You see this? So Nkrumah has... Oh my gosh. Like, so on an economic mindset, on an economic mindset, Nkrumah understood the assignment. Under, Nkrumah understood the assignment. On an economic mindset, he understood the assignment. He was, and you're going to, you're going to go, he's going to go down the list. They were able to give Ghana some industrial, and this is the thing, you could do this in a fucking generation. You could do this with one good leader. One good leader. 
Who can do it? But 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 your, your good leader has to understand the fucking threat when they see it. You don't play some motherfucking Rast cast. That was a little. I think it was a sixteen-year-old boy when he wrote that rhyme. But you know, you know, you gotta understand the nature of the threat. You don't let freedom ring with a buckshot, but not just shed. First, we need to truly understand the nature of the threat. You understand? You. Torrated. as the country was reoriented towards the West. Ultimately, the coup was orchestrated because Nkrumah was seen as a threat to Western economic interests as they feared he would nationalize resources. The Americans had invested a lot in the Volta Dam and felt that if this project did not succeed, they would lose money and international credibility. They wanted the project completed while minimizing Nkrumah's power. U.S. foreign affairs officials interpreted Nkrumah's policies in the context of Egypt's nationalization of the Suez Canal, the subsequent Soviet funding of the Aswan High Dam, and the 1964 Panama Canal crisis that threatened American control of the waterway. Nkrumah's sponsorship of anti-imperial causes around Africa was understood by Western powers as destabilizing rather than supporting American democracy. His role as a key member of the non-aligned movement, which aimed to chart a viable third way, could only be seen by binary thinking Cold War politicians as anti-Western. U.S. foreign policy in Africa was primarily driven by anxiety about the threat of Soviet and Chinese interests. Africans no. became ciphers, illegible, except in how they could help unravel communism. U.S. foreign affairs and intelligence officials discussed using psychological warfare to isolate Nkrumah and turn public support away from him. It is striking that mid-level U.S. and British agents felt they had the moral and political right to assess an African regime's right to exist. The lives and interests of people, particularly black people, in a sovereign country were insignificant. Nkrumah firmly believed that political independence was meaningless without economic independence. Thus, by the time he was overthrown in the CIA-inspired coup, Ghana had a whopping 68 sprawling state-owned factories. Now, this is what it is. I want you guys to pay attention to this. This is why this is a good video, but you really have to come to the conclusion. You see, I don't like the title, Why Nkrumah Was a Threat. That's why I renamed it. Why America, right? But, but again, we're going into it. Listen to this. Listen to this part. This is critical. And make and make sure you ask any of your questions because you know, after this is over, you know it's over. Producing every need of the population from shoes to textiles to furniture to lorry tires to canned fruits to vegetables and beef to glass to radio and TV to books to steel to educated manpower virtually everything Nkrumah wanted to you industrialize see, I, Ghana in a generation a single generation and everything was on course until the powers that be used some disgruntled self-serving Ghanaian soldiers to stage that coup that slow rolled Ghana's progress it was a major setback, not only for Ghana, but the whole of Africa. Again, you see that? You know, again, you, he could have, you could do this in a generation. You, you could do this in a generation. That's what we have to understand as a people. Why is Africa poor? Right? Why? And, and as soon as you understand that you could be prosperous within a fucking generation, as long as you do not fall for the fucking heavyweights, for the, for the, especially for the Americans, you know, the fucking Mike Tyson of, 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 of nationality, of, na of nationhood, right? As long as you don't get into the boxing ring with Mike Tyson, you could be a world champion. You know, that, that that's true. As long as you don't get a boxing ring with the world champion, 
You could be like, as long as you stay in the lightweight, the featherweight. You could you could do some damage. You know what I mean? Uh, I think uh, it was Floyd Mayweather. Floyd Mayweather. I think I, I think I might. I don't know his weight. I don't know his weight. He might be a lightweight. I don't know. He, he could be a champion as long as you don't get in the ring with Mike Tyson. You know what I'm saying? You know he could get, he could be a champion as long as you don't get in the ring with Muhammad Ali. Fuck you doing fighting the heavyweight? The fuck you doing allowing a heavyweight in, 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 in the ring with you? You know, America's like, hey man, I'm just gonna just gonna stick around here. I, I see you're uh, you're doing some sort of shit. I see you're doing something. Let me just uh, let me just sit right here. And they five years plotting for your damn demise. And they're telling you, hey man, you know it's a good idea if you go to go. Like, I, I don't want to harp over this whole Vietnam thing, but come on, like come on, like you know, like you just say, man, that's none of my business. I mean, because look, I like Ho Chi Minh, too. I didn't mention it when I said Stalin and uh, thing, but I like Ho Chi Minh because Ho Chi Minh was, uh, I mean, for lack of a better word. Well, Ho Chi Minh respected Garvey. Let's say it that way. Ho Chi Minh saw Marcus Garvey and was like, that guy, you know? Uh, you know, no Lewinsky, but he was like, my nigga. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> my nigga. <laughs> I don't know. But, like, he, he get it. You get it, right? Uh, and I'm not saying, I'm not saying that I wouldn't personally, you know, if it, if it were the case that, you know, let's say if I did like Ho Chi Minh, right, that I wouldn't personally go and visit um, Ho Chi Minh in Vietnam and so on and so forth. I'm not saying that. But would I do that for America? Absolutely fucking not. Would I do it for myself? Sure. But, uh, and then, of course, you have to have protocol in place. It's just so fucking embarrassing. Like, like, like you're, you're dealing with, like, it's amateur hour and professionals. You know, it's like, it's like I could win at karaoke night, you know, I, but before this podcast, I remember somebody told me that I had, I, I could sing a good reggae tune, right? I could win at karaoke night if I'm not doing against Beyonce. You know, Beyonce's in the competition. No, I ain't gonna fucking win. Are you fucking crazy? You gotta, you gotta know, like, you gotta know, you gotta, you gotta know your weight class. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta know your weight class. That's it. That's 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 what I say. Go back to what Nareri said. In fact, we actually might just peep into that book very briefly, um, just to go into what Nareri said. Uh, but but you know we have to be serious. I think I actually see maybe there's some comments. Let's see. Um, bro, black. Uh, brother, black. Bakari. I almost said bro, black. Bro, black. Uh, brother. Bak- I almost said it again. Brother Bakari says peace and black power. I'm really late. Um, and then real black gentleman says been listening, bro. Yeah, man. I everybody. Yeah. Uh, appreciate y'all. Um, Anyway, if you guys have any questions, let me know before we, uh, before Ghana. we, uh, think. If Nkrumah had been allowed to complete his industrialization plan, Ghana would today have been another Singapore on the west coast of Africa. However, we are left with nostalgia only to wonder what might have been if Dr. Nkrumah was never overthrown. Let me know in the comments if you like this type of deep dive long analysis and if you liked the video and you're open to having some better understanding of Africa, consider liking it and subscribing to Reason Africa. Every single video will make you realize just how much more there is to know about Africa. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time. Oh, damn, I'm not even speaking. All right, so <laughs> I'm there talking uh, forever, and there's nothing going on, but it is what it is. Um, so, again, we're going to go. I thought we were going to end, but make sure you guys ask any questions you have um, before we before we fully close off, just so just in case. Because, again, you're not going to hear me from another week, right? Um, unless you're on Shoot the Breeze or something, but or, or you're on Brother Bakari or, or Forecast. But, um, uh, but, like, this is my favorite. This is, this is, this is my favorite president. Of 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 Africa, Julius Nyerere. So he says, "Develop a country takes tremendous goodwill from the state, right?" And here's a part that I really liked. Now, again, you could actually click on this. Um, you could actually find this speech. But he says, "Look, it needs nursing." We're talking about the economy, right? Or right, let's just go right here. He says, uh, "This whole passage is really good, but I don't want to. I don't want to just read all of it, right?" And again, and again, like I said, you could just listen to it. Actually, you know what? 
fuck it, let's go. Um, no, let's just read this part. No, let's read the fucking thing. Let's go. So he says, look, no, 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 actually, no. Let, let's just go to it. So he says, uh, let's just go over here. He says, we're talking about economies, right? And he says, look, economies need nursing. And they go on nursing it. So the Japanese did it, Korea. Korea, tough, tough. It's only now they're beginning to open up their market. How do you open up your market to big competitors when you have no power to compete with big competitors? This is ridiculous. Now, again, this is what Ghana does right after uh, the coup. It opens its market to big competitors and the big competitors take over Ghana. Okay? Because you cannot compete against big competitors. I can't just open up a store and compete against Walmart at this moment. Now, Walmart could... Now, like, I can't just... And I mean, it's a little different if you're in America. Maybe you can compete with Walmart, sort of, right? In some sort of capacity, but not really, right? Because again, Walmart did start off as a big, small store itself. So it's not like it's impossible to compete. Um, it's just a matter of... But now if you're in Africa, it's completely different. It's completely different. Uh, but anyway, so in the world of boxing, there are heavyweights, middleweights, flyweights, and featherweights. And although the rules are the same... You put them in separate rings. The heavyweights get their own ring. The middleweights get their own ring. You don't put in the same ring a heavyweight and a featherweight. Never! Never! How do you do that? That is murder. It's got to be called that. But that's what the big seven are telling us to do. The Germany and that Germany and Burkina Faso should get in the same ring. And that's called globalization, freedom, liberalization. This is nonsense. This is absolute nonsense. You protect the weak until they can become strong before they can compete. Always. This is a rule everywhere. But our leaders, even if we tell them that, dare not argue. They can't argue. Wanangopa. You can't say no. Right? Our problem is the weakness. All right. So you see what I'm saying. So um, that's it. You know, that's, that's pretty much... Uh, uh, all I could say now, the, I did want to, I did kind of want to show something else, but it's all good. I appreciate everybody for coming through. I appreciate everybody for, um, stopping by. I hope you guys enjoyed, uh, this video. I think it should be translated into Swahili. I did want to show you guys an example of a Swahili translation, but I think I could just upload it as a YouTube short and you guys could see, um, what I saw. But other than that, I appreciate your time. Uh, let me shout out everybody who was here. Kofi was here. I appreciate Kofi. Light bearer, natural, naturally spiritual. I actually have her book, you know? So I appreciate the sister. She wrote a children's book. Uh, Real Black Gentleman, um, Ellie. I don't know if I've, I've seen Ellie here before, but I appreciate Ellie for coming through. Uh, Brother Bakari was here. And that, that, that seems like the, the list of it. But appreciate everybody for being here. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope somebody learned something. And if you didn't, you know, it's cool. Leave it in the comments. Provide Triggers Revolutions here. He says, can we have the link to this article? This is not an article. Wait, what link? What article? So, this, Provided Triggers for Evolution, this is my book, The Book of Power. Um, so, I mean, if you're talking about the thing that on the screen right now, that's The Book of Power. If you're talking about the YouTube video, that was, that's in the description in the, in the, in the, in the video. So, you can watch the uh, description. And the, the, the link for the book is also in the description. Also, if you wanted this Nerere um, speech, um, you can, like, I could actually just link that for you um well let me see if i can remember which one it is but um because it's actually pretty hard to find um oh, i think it's this one right here so i'm going to show you guys the screen i don't know if it's this one actually but it looks like this one hold on a second let me just show you guys the screen real quickly um so you could see i just searched narrate speeches um it, it looks like it's this one right but this one is partially or a lot of it is in swahili okay so at some point he just started speaking english but i think it was this one because like based off of the background but you probably won't be able to understand most of it so this was actually probably it right here so julius area on development and private enterprise um that might be it because again it's the same background um and he's just you know what do you have you know all right whatever. <laughs> like i love it so um i'll send you the link um, so a part of what the, I did in the Book of Power was that I, uh, 
um, I did just, I, I translated a lot of people's stuff and I gave a preface and commentary on some of the videos, some of the audio that's already available to us. Because the reality is this, that some of these things are going to be taken down off of the internet. Some of these things are going to be deleted. Some of these things are going to be, you know, somebody's account could get stolen or, or whatever. So it's just good to have it in paper form. Um, you know, just so that whenever the digital copy is lost, you still have the paper copy. Um, let me just see if this is, just double check. Um, let me just double check that. By the way, this Costa, this Coast Contra song, Never, that's a pretty, it's a pretty damn good song. I ain't gonna hold you guys. Uh, the freestyle is pretty good. Uh, let's just see if this is uh, where he said that. But yeah, I can babble. I love how he says it, man. He's so good. Um, the Japanese have not done it. The yeah, see, this is it. it. They will be meeting in Halifax in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in June. They will be meeting in Halifax. What for? To drink tea? <laughs> what do you think they are going to, to meet to, to do in Halifax? The big seven are going to meet in Halifax. To do what? To discuss how to control the economy. But this is in the book of power. It's not a meeting of bankers. It's a meeting of presidents and prime ministers on the economy. On the economy. And this is this. Ignorant people in Africa are being deceived, you know, don't do, don't leave it to the private sector. Where is the private sector? Where is the private sector in Tanzania to which you are going to leave to leave this development of the world? Where is it? It needs nothing. It needs nothing before you can have it. Is it? So you nurse it. This is what the Asian countries have done. And they go on nursing it. So the Japanese did it. Korea. Korea. Tough. It's only now they are beginning to open up their market. How do you open up your market to big competitors when you have no power to compete with big competitors? <laughs> this is ridiculous. I mean, it's like, uh, Madam, I, I'm sorry. You, you know, in, in the world... So look, I, I just got to pause for a second just so I don't get that copyright strike. But, um, but you guys could see, basically, I transcribed this and I gave it a preface. And obviously I have our own original articles, but it's really important to capture the intelligence of, especially our intelligent African leaders. So Nirere was, I'm going to tell you guys straight up, I, I would say second or best in the 20th century of all African people, okay? So I would say second, third, second or third, well, first, second or third, you know, and the top three would be Marcus Messiah Garvey, it would be Carlos A. Cooks, and it would be Julius Nyerere. But the thing about Julius Nyerere that distinguishes him, that really pushes him forward, is that he was a president of uh, millions of people. You know, Marcus Garvey was also technically a president. Carl A. Cooks wasn't. Carl A. Cooks, however, um, wasn't a socialist like Nyerere was, right? Um, but but again, I want you guys to hear this uh, because you know, um, providing triggers for revolution um, asked. We're, we're just going to play some of this, you know, just for, uh, just for them. Like I said, I mostly pause just for the, uh, you know, the copyright strikes, because that's a thing, unfortunately. Um, again, I, di I didn't produce this video. I just um, transcribed it so that we could have a record for our people. Um, and I think I might have to do this for more African leaders. And, but I might do it in... So in the world of boxing, yeah? <laughs> in the world of boxing, the heavyweights... Middleweight, flyweight, featherweight, and although the rules are the same, you put them separately in separate rings. <laughs> Look, the heavyweight in, in their own ring, you see? the middleweight in their own ring. You know, you don't put in the same ring you know, a heavyweight and a featherweight. <laughs> Never. Never! How do you do that? That is murder. It's got to be called freedom. <laughs> but, uh, but that's what that's what uh, the, the, that's what the big seven are telling us to do. That that Germany and Burkina Faso should get in the same ring, <laughs> and that is called the globalization, freedom, liberalization. This is nonsense. <laughs> This is absolute nonsense. You protect the weak until they become strong before they can compete. Always. This is the rule. This is the rule everywhere. But, but our leaders, even if we tell them that, they, they dare not argue. They can't argue. You can't say no.
Yeah, so you kind of see that he also, even though I read the same thing, he just did it so much better, right? <laughs> now, what's interesting is this. If, sometimes if you want to, so, you know, when I said I transcribed, sometimes you can do show transcript, and but you notice on the side, the transcript is actually in um, Turkish for some reason, right? Which doesn't make any sense. Um, and then not just that, it's, uh, um, like if you look, if you look for s subtitles, they're automatically generated in Turkish, which is, you know, kind of nonsensical. Um, so realistically, yeah, when I had to transcribe these things, I had to write it all out. And that's partly why I also, you know, charge money for the book is because, you know, you put human labor into producing something of, of real quality. Um, and, and that's a thing. But anyway, I hope, uh, hope you'll like that, uh, provide triggers. Uh, but that's it. Yeah, that's a uh, that's a uh, you know we have to get into our minds. So anyway, if anybody has any other questions, any other observations, now's the time. Other than that, you know it might be time for me to head out. Oh, actually, guys, check out Cassandra Cheeks. Cassandra Cheeks is talking about um, CRT again. So that's critical race theory. So make sure you guys um, check her out. But other than that, Shami um, Hotep, Anku Ja Seneb Neb Amen Maat. Do I nature?